this video is going to be a little controversial because while most people are finagling their finances in December, wondering how they're going to get the gifts and put quality meals on the table, I'm not stressed out at all. Because honey, I ain't most people. So I've got the gifts, the food, and the family time covered, and my budget isn't feeling the squeeze. In this month's pantry chat, I'm going to share what to buy and avoid so that you can get the most bang for your buck without coupons, delicious meals that your family will beg you to make from one pot meals to delicious side dishes. I've even got the cheapest way to buy gifts and I am shocked most people don't do it. I'll also share updates about my deer hunt, more farm skills I'm learning, and y'all's favorite visitors back in town. What I'm saying is that you might wanna settle in because I treat these pantry chats like you're right here in my kitchen. I'm showing you eight different recipes you can make now, freeze, or can to have your own shelf stable ingredients. There's gonna be a link below this video you'll want to click because it has the grocery guide I made for you so that you can print it or reference it on your phone as you shop later this month. It has a list of the fruits and vegetables you should stock up on because they're in season and at their lowest price even without a coupon and will be abundant for the next few weeks or months. My grocery guide even gives you a few recipe cards to per page so that you can print and add to your recipe box or binder. Now I'm gonna read this list out loud, but as I do, grind your gears and think about what your preservation plan will be. Because in addition to eating it fresh, are you gonna can it, ferment it, freeze it, dehydrate it, whatever, so that you have enough to last when you can no longer source it inexpensively or grow it yourself? All right, so the vegetables that are in season and your sales flyer will advertise as being on sale include Allium bulb, so things like your onions and shallots, beets, bok choy, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, carrots, celery, cauliflower, chicories, fennel, greens. And hey, did you know that fresh but wilted greens can be replumped with a 15 minute soak in cold water? Yep, try it. I've got tons of tips like that for all the fruits and vegetables. Uh, leeks, mushrooms, parsnips, potatoes, rutabagas, sweet potatoes, turnips, and your winter squash. So things like uh, your butternut, your acorn, and spaghetti squash. And the seasonal fruits that you'll want to buy include apples, avocados, citrus, so like your grapefruit, your oranges, and your tangerines, cranberries, this is likely the last month for those, kiwis, kumquat, lemons and limes, pears, and persimmons. One of your go-to fall and winter mealtime staples should be any type of winter squash. It's an ingredient that has so many meal possibilities, including these hearty squash burrito boats that people that claim they don't like squash even enjoy. Since winter squash are in season and they store for months if kept in a cool, dry place, they make a weekly appearance on our menu during the colder months. Butternut squash is perfect for stuffing anything inside of, which is why I'm going to make a Tex-Mex ground beef and veggie filling that is oh so satisfying. After you cut the squash in half, place it on a baking sheet. Next, you'll drizzle with a bit of olive oil, which helps to create a caramelized interior and keeps it from drying out during baking. You'll also add a few pinches of salt and pepper to taste. Next, you're gonna grab a skillet and place it over medium heat. Then you'll add chopped onion along with a bit of minced garlic and your ground beef. Season with chili powder, cumin, salt and pepper, then add cooked black beans, corn, this is some that I can this summer, and then you'll also pour in some red enchilada sauce. Give things a good mix so that the flavors start to meld together, and by now your squash is probably tender, so pull it out of the oven and let it cool a bit before you start to create a well and scoop out some of the flesh, which you're just gonna dump into your skillet mixture. Also, be sure to coat the filling over the squash so that it has time to soak up all that seasoning. Transfer your scooped out squash to a plate and fill with your burrito beef skillet filling. It's perfectly fine to dig in now, but I like to amp it up even more by adding shredded cheese, usually a sharp cheddar and mozzarella mix, along with diced tomatoes, and finally, a dash of fresh herbs, which is usually cilantro or parsley or whatever I can grab out of the garden. And there you have it, a butternut squash burrito boat, which is sure to fill up your hungriest eaters. This recipe is bursting with flavors and texture and ingredients you can feel good about. Oh, the butternut squash skin will be super tender as it cooks and easily cuts with a knife or fork, so be sure to eat the skin as you enjoy every bite. The skin is thin and barely detectable, and I think it adds a subtle contrast to the soft interior of the squash. This recipe with exact measurements is included in this month's grocery guide.
Now, in previous pantry chats, you've watched me buy heads of cabbage and ferment them to make my own sauerkraut. It's a great way to have a probiotic recipe that tastes delish because homemade sauerkraut tastes so, so, so much better than anything you will ever find in a store. And I say this as someone who was convinced they didn't like sauerkraut until I finally gave it a try and made it myself. Anywho, I have jars of this stuff because we eat it as a side and it's also a delicious condiment. And just because you ferment it doesn't mean you can't use it in cooked recipes. Now, yes, it loses its probiotic goodness, but it's still valuable as a cooked vegetable. So if you have jars of sauerkraut that you want to get through a little bit faster, or you just enjoy the taste of sauteed cabbage, this next recipe is a winner. This dish is one of our favorite sandwiches and one that I serve even when we have company coming. It starts with medium or spicy ground sausage, which you'll cook until it's fully brown. Then take the crumbles and drain them, being sure to keep those pan drippings for the next part of the recipe. Now grab some peppers and remember if you pop out the stem, you can cut and use the top so that you get the most juice out of your pepper. I usually save the seed part for making vegetable stock. Then take a medium sized onion and chop that up too. Transfer your chopped ingredients to the pan you cooked your sausage in, which should still have the drippings. And hey, some of y'all may call this sausage fat or sausage grease, but baby doll, let's agree that when it's done, you'll call this delish. Add the cooked sausage back in the pan and then grab your jar of kraut. I'll link a video showing you how to start fermenting if you're a newbie, but boy do I love having this on hand for both raw and cooked recipes. Scoop a generous portion of your kraut into the pan and mix it all together with everything else. Gracious, you could eat it just like this, but since these are sandwiches, grab some buns. Now, you could use plain old hamburger buns, but a pretzel bun truly sets this recipe off and leans more into an authentic German-inspired pairing. A grocery store near my house bakes these fresh, and this is the perfect recipe to grab them. Anywho, let's get back to the sandwich. On a baking sheet, add your cooked sausage and kraut mixture to the bottom bun. Then take a slice or two of provolone cheese and place that on top of the crumbles. Place the top bun over the cheese and slide into a warm oven to bake for five to eight minutes. And what comes out is this deliciousness. I know you wanna grab these through the screen. Now my husband likes to add even more fresh kraut on top along with the spread of mayo and ketchup, but I can never wait that long. Peppers, sausage, and kraut on a pretzel bun is a quick one pan dinner you'll come back to again and again. The recipe card is in December's grocery guide. While fresh broccoli is available year round, you will absolutely get the best flavor when it's in season, which usually starts in October and lasts clear through March. And here's a recipe that shows off how delicious that flavor really can be. You'll start by sizzling up some chopped onions and garlic in a pat of butter and let those flavors collide until the onions are translucent and the garlic is bronzed. Then you'll scoop them out and set to the side until we grab them a little bit later. In the same pan, drop in more butter, sprinkle with flour, then check to make sure it's thickening up on you. Add some chicken broth bit by bit, then pour in a full fat milk in frequent pours between stirring. While that's simmering, let's get to the broccoli and honey, you'll want to go with fresh. Plus why not since broccoli is in season and at its best taste this time of the year. Cut your broccoli into florets, then get out your food processor or hand grater so that we can grate the cheese. You're watching me set up my stainless steel processor, which comes with several surgical steel cones that allow you to quickly cut a variety of vegetables, fruits, crackers, cheeses, sausage, and more super fast and efficiently. Now, some of y'all have been in my kitchen for years, and if you have, you're thinking to yourself, Cassandra, Where'd you get that? Since my ninja broke. Honey, one day I went to go use it and I plugged it in and it made this like winding down sound and then it just went silent. And so I thought like maybe it was the outlet. So I switched to like the one underneath and then the one like even on this side of the wall and nothing, it was just silent. And I realized this thing had died on me. Now I know appliances don't last forever. And I did have this for about eight years, but even though it's a blender, I used it as a food processor. But goodness, I always feel some kind of way when appliances break on me. So when I was thinking about how I was gonna replace this, my mind immediately went to a solution that I've been using for the past few years. I asked myself, what was the Victorian era equivalent? Those appliances didn't rely on electricity. They were built to last. And if there was a glitch, it's usually straightforward enough to repair it without needing a manual, or you can just use basic hand tools. That's why I use a manual coffee grinder that's over 100 years old. Not only does it look stunning, but it's a wall mounted cast iron coffee grinder. I use a hand operated tomato mill, and we supplement our heat with the Perfection kerosene heaters, which are also over 100 years old because they're just easier to operate. If I could have a fully Victorian kitchen, I would. The only thing that stops me is that because I have a full-time job and I know the quantity of food that I want to put up, 
having some modern appliances does make sense. But boy, do I see the utility and quality hand tools that yes, I nearly always purchase secondhand. You've got to be a stickler about using block cheese and grating it yourself because pre-shedded cheese is often coated in anti-caking agents that can prevent the cheese from melting into a lusciously creamy soup. So buy a block of cheese and grate it yourself. Do you see how fast and effortlessly this gives you beautifully shredded cheese? Let's head back to the sauce, which you need to season with a bit of salt, pepper, ground mustard, smoked paprika, and cayenne. Give that a good stir and then add in your cheese. Next, fold in the broccoli and then the garlic and onions mix that we set to the side a bit earlier. Let everything simmer until the broccoli is soft and when that's done, your soup is ready to eat. It's about 40 degrees outside and so this soup was so satisfying to eat as I cozied on the couch with a good book. My homemade soup has tons of fresh broccoli, is made from real ingredients, and is a fraction of what you pay at the deli. We are officially in chili soup season and I love it. As soon as cold weather hits, I start getting a hankering for chili, which I could happily enjoy eating for every meal for days at a time. I've got some red chili beans on hand. Oddly, I haven't been able to find dark red, but I'm using my KitchenAid stand mixer bowl because it's large enough for me to soak my beans in and won't take up countertop space. Now my dad is coming up and this time of the year, it's an unspoken agreement that I'm gonna have some seasoned collard greens waiting for him to eat for lunch while I'm at work. These are collard greens that I found at the market. Aren't they beautiful? Now, since this is a big batch, I'm grabbing my roaster pan and after washing my greens, I'm going to cut off the stems, but I'm setting them to the side because I have another recipe for them that I'll show you in a bit. All right, let's cut up these greens and add them to the roaster. All right, so we've added the leafy greens to the pot. Now let's get the collard stalks and make sure we've cut off the leafy parts from those and clean off the stalks as much as we can. Now let's add some chopped onion and here's where I'm grabbing my secret and shortcut ingredients from my home can pantry. Honey, I've got a jar of deeply flavorful corn stalk, fully cooked smoked turkey necks that have been marinating for over a year on the shelf. And I'm going to add about two or three quarts of those to the pan and I've also got some ham broth that I made last year. I just had to jump in here real quick because this is just one of the many things that I love about canning. So I put my foot in this corn stalk from this summer, which, oh my goodness, the aromatics on this, oh, it is just divine. And then this ham bone broth, which I think is from, I think it's from 2022. Oh, here it is. Oh, 520. All right. So this is just Oh, it is so divine. It smells so good. And then I already have these smoked uh, turkey necks here. Oh my gosh. And this is authentic flavor, right? This is not a powder. This is not a mix. I mean, they smell amazing. So I know it looks a little weird in the jar, but those folks who say that, and that used to be me too before I started canning, I'd be like, what is that? But you, if, in a blind like smell test, you would be like, oh, that is amazing. I mean, oh, these are going to be so good. Dad's going to be so proud. Since I already have my meat and broths made, I just add everything to the roaster and get these greens simmering. Okay, I've just added the smoked turkey necks and look, look at how tender this meat is. With the slightest touch, it just falls away from the bone. Goodness, it's so tender and I get all that instant flavor. I usually fill the dump jars with water, shake it up, and add it to the roaster to get every bit of taste from the jar. Okay, let's stir this together and take this to the roasting pan. Oh, this is too funny. I had to show this to you. All right, so the meat in um, the meat off the hand bone is so tender off these turkey necks. Look at this clean bone, y'all. I mean, oh. It's just already so tender. Of course, I'm gonna leave it in there so it um it has good flavor and it's gonna cook right along in there. But oh my goodness, I mean you 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 can't beat that. Oh, you can't beat that. I cannot hide the sheer joy that I get from having my home can ingredients. And if you're a canner, you get it. Now all I have to do is let this simmer low and slow for most of the day. So while that's going, let's go ahead and pickle our collard green stalks. They give a wonderful crunch, a satisfying a celery, so why not make yourself a quick snack that you can dip in hummus or just eat straight out of the jar? Essentially, you're creating a brine solution, which is made by combining water, vinegar, typically white or apple cider vinegar, with salt and sugar. A common ratio is three parts water to one part vinegar. Then you add your spices to the brine for flavor and whatever amounts you want, and pour the brine over the stalks and then store them in the fridge where they'll keep for several weeks to a few months. 
All right, it's the next day and the soaked beans are ready. I'm going to transfer them to a large stock pot, add water, and bring them to a quick boil. After they've tenderized, I'm going to add sweet chipotle sauce, and I love this brand's flavor. And the ingredient list is short and pronounceable. Then I'm adding peppers and onions. This is going to be a meatless chili because I already have jars of canned beef on my shelf, and sometimes I just like to keep our chili vegetarian. Would you look at these greens? I think I did pretty good, but only dad's seal of approval will tell. I always get a little nervous because pleasing a southern man's taste buds, especially when he's comparing what you cook to his mama's, is nothing to fool around with. He'll be in town tomorrow, so I'll heat it up then. I finally got around to removing multiple baggies of herbs crammed into quart-sized jars into my corner hutch, which I originally wanted to use to showcase china dishes, but I repurposed it as the apothecary. I'll link to the video showing how a beginner, like me, can set up an apothecary and show you six homemade herbal medicines to boost your winter wellness. Citrus is also in season, and a recipe that I really enjoy is from the blog, A Farm Girl in the Making, which I'll link below. The blogger behind this recipe is Anna Seta Scott, and she is an author and homesteader in Tennessee. I had the chance to meet Anne at the Homesteaders of America conference, and I love her. Canning lemons is a perfect way to preserve the citrus harvest because you can use this recipe as a canned lemonade concentrate as well as a warm beverage on cold days or to soothe sore throats and coughs. Oh, you might also enjoy it with fresh strawberries during the summer months. Now, I dehydrate lemons to have on hand for herbal and medicinal teas that I make, but I also enjoy having this lemon syrup on hand, and I like to keep a few jars tucked away in my apothecary. Just be sure to wash the skins of your lemons extremely well before cooking with them to get the wax off. Wax serves many different purposes. The wax prevents bruising, inhibits mold from forming, and helps to preserve the fruit, and they just do this to make the fruits and vegetables look more appealing. To remove it, all you need to do is throw your citrus in a bowl of very hot water, leave it there for five minutes, and then give it a gentle rub with a brush or cloth, and you'll actually see the wax floating in the water, and your fruit will be, you know, naked and ready to cook with. This time of the year, citrus is very inexpensive, so this is a recipe that you will want to stock up on. Plus, plus, these jars just look stunning sitting in plain sight on your counter. Just saying. We're in the Christmas season, and while each family has their own traditions, for most folks, this is the time of year that you're gifting everyone you know. Your kids, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your neighbors, and whoever else. Stacking all those people into one month can quickly add up to, I don't know, an extra 50 to $500 or more that you wouldn't normally be spending. I'm gonna share what we do and our take on things. Now, please, please take this as an eat the fish, spit out the bones kind of thing, because I'm not trying to be combative. I'm just trying to help you keep money in your pocket. Now, we mark Christmas as the time to celebrate the birth of Christ. And yes, neither December 25th nor the season are historically accurate, so it's more of an annual commemoration. My brother and I grew up with this season being filled with lots of church activities. Hymnal concerts on Christmas Day, the women of the church would all gather together. I still remember this very fondly. And we would cook breakfast for everyone. Um, we would go see my grandparents or other family members or they would be up here uh, to visit that kind of thing and gifts are very practical like winter wear something educational like a book series or something recreational like a new bike or a game or a toy that you could use that wasn't electronic now I went to public school so I was always aware of the mainstream Christmas but one thing that our parents repeatedly said to us is that we were so blessed that we did not have to wait for December 25th to anticipate gifts because we all always had exactly what we needed and we got gifts throughout the year. Now we were a middle class family. My mom was an elementary teacher and my dad was in the Air Force, but what they were saying was true. Plus my dad would often deploy, so we got used to making dates on the calendar that would give us those special memories when he was out of town. Just remember that the things that go under a tree is stuff, but that the real gift is time or helping someone out and these things should be happening well in advance of the 25th and certainly after. So when my parents are up, y'all will see that we often go out and do something. And honey, that's the real gift that you can't put under a tree. We eat really good meals together, we talk, we go on day trips and hikes. And so when that stuff is regularly happening in your relationships, it seems silly to put them on the line for one date. I'd like to think we do a 19th century Christmas. I just have a simple wreath on the door, and yes, 
we have a tree, but we don't have any gifts under it. And even the ornaments that are on the tree are pretty sparse, but each one of them are from places that we've been. So really, the tree is more like a hanging memory album. So the gifts that we give our friends and our family and our neighbors are really small or simple homemade tokens of appreciation. Because Lord willing, you'll have the next 11 months to show them how much you really do care about them and not have everyone stacked up in one single month. Plus, with that mindset, you won't wreck your budget. I'm climbing up to the attic to find the gifts I purchased in early January last year because that's the month where you'll find everything on sale for at least 50% off or more. For details, revisit my January pantry chat, but these gifts weren't more than 50 cents to $2. I spent less than $25 for gifts that I'll deploy for about 15 people. I've got candles, cookie tins, ornaments, beverage boxes, gift wrap. Super cute and no one will be the wiser that I shopped for my attic department store. Now let's get to the fun, setting up the tree. of September 2016 and we have just heard from our realtor that um, our offer was accepted for the house that we really really wanted <laughs> so this is a toast to a bright future well, this is the old city hall they wanted to destroy this building. up an appetite and basil pesto pasta using the basil agur this summer and froze to enjoy later was exactly what we were in the mood for. This meal came together quickly because all I had to do was boil the noodles, add a bit of cream, and the sauce was already made. I scooped this on plates, tossed with some diced tomatoes, and we sat down to enjoy our tree. If this is our first time meeting, hi, I'm Cassandra from the blog, becomingafarmgirl.com. I'm here to help you live a farm fresh life without land or livestock. Thor, when, when Grandpa comes, you can't forget about Mama. <laughs> He's already like, what? Is he here? <laughs> yes, he knows my dad's name. <laughs> it's Grandpa Booma. <laughs> it's Grandpa Booma. <laughs> ah! How you doing, little Kiyama? Went right by me. <laughs> You've been a good boy. Have you been a good boy? You've been eating, girl. You're fat. You haven't been exercising. When did I say you've been on a good walk anyway? Remember what I said about pleasing a southern man? Well, greens have to be paired with beans. 
and hot water cornbread. If you haven't had hot water cornbread, honey, you are missing out. There are some simple recipes that in order for you to truly appreciate, you've got to grow up eating them because you need the nostalgia connected with them. And for us, it's hot water cornbread. Now, it's nothing fancy, just cornmeal, salt, lard, and hot water. But when I taste these crisp fried patties, I'm again transported to my grandmother's and great-grandmother's Louisiana kitchens. Now my dad insists that they've got to be shaped in between your hands to look like corn husks because that's the way his mama did it. So that's how I do it too. Then you fry these golden delights which are pure heaven. Ideally I'd have black eyed peas with collard greens but I used the chili beans that I already prepared. All right, let's assemble everything and give this to dad. I heated the greens and scooped them into a bowl, being sure to add a sufficient amount of pot liquor, which you call it that, not broth, sprinkled with sugar, another one of my dad's quirks, and took it to the table. So first I walked the hot water cornbread over and then I came back to get the greens and the beans. But by then that man had stuffed a piece of cornbread in his mouth before we even said grace. So I asked him, dad, when was the last time you had hot water cornbread? Last time I ate it up here. <laughs> <laughs> How does it taste, for real? No, it's good. Okay, all right. That's why I reach for it, so I eat it with nothing else. <laughs> mm. And there's your allowance. That's two tablespoons of sugar, Dad, for That's between your greens good. and your chili. When it comes to my cooking, I'm a mutt. My mom is from the North, Maryland to be exact, which has a very different culinary style than the taste that my dad grew up on in Louisiana. A sugar dish is just something that man's gonna do. So I at least try to monitor how much he adds. And don't get it twisted. My greens have excellent flavor and they do not need sugar but I know he's gonna reach for it anyways. In the months that I've helped a friend with her quail business, this bird's meat and eggs have started to make regular appearances on our menu. These are some birds that we recently harvested and you can see that they remind you of many chickens, except that quail is mostly dark meat and a bit gamier tasting like duck. This spring, I'm going to start keeping a few in my backyard so I'll have access to my own meat and eggs since my HOA doesn't allow us to keep chickens. I'm so glad quail is a loophole. I decided to make some fried quail and y'all wait till you see how they turned out. I like to soak my meat in buttermilk because it helps tenderize things and helps the breading adhere to the skin. Honey, if you ask me for measurements of this, girl, I don't know. I just call it seasoning the flour and what I reach for always changes. But you can see what I used. You don't always need a recipe and as long as you don't overuse one spice or add too much salt, you likely won't go wrong. Guess what? I used the quail legs to create my egg wash. You see me using scissors because quail eggs have a tough membrane so it doesn't crack easily like a chicken egg. I'm gonna serve the quail with rice and green beans so I'm gonna add some brown rice to a pan of boiling water and I'm gonna drop in some chicken bouillons I made with the pan drippings of a whole chicken. This will add instant flavor. All right, now it's time to heat the oil on the stove and get these birds in the pan. I pretty much set up an assembly line and start by thoroughly coating the birds with flour, and then shaking off the excess. And then I swirl it around in the egg mixture until it is completely coated. And then I dip it back in the flour because I want extra crispy, crunchy skin. Then and only then do I add it to the pan of oil. With each bird, I was so appreciative that this was meat I could take pride in saying that I helped taking care of, that I knew the conditions it grew under and its source. The eggs came from my Shire Farm, a small business owner, and were raised by a seller whose eggs I bought years before knowing her at the farmer's market. Hey, I'm just gonna be honest, all of my meals aren't this way, so I sure do value the small ways I get to fold in eating locally into our menu. Now would you look at this crispy skin? I don't think I need to tell you how uh, delicious my fried quail turned out because <laughs> you can see it. I opened a can of home canned green beans and heated them up and a few minutes later it was time to ladle the tender rice seasoned with homemade chicken bouillon, then plate my green beans, which mom and I likely snapped the ends off together, followed by my fried quail. Woo, now ain't that a meal? In real life I'm eating this with my hands but I'll use a knife to show you the inside. And here it is. Y'all, quail is really good. 
Here's my husband's plate, which looks like a Sunday dinner, even though this is Saturday. All right, let me take it to him. Ooh, I've also got to update you on Turkey Dispatch Day at my friend Crystal's. So Crystal also grows out Thanksgiving turkeys for herself and several members of her family. Here's our basic setup, and she invited several other friends that had a few roosters that they wanted to dispatch to come over. The roosters are beautiful, and I knew that I wanted to grab a few of their feathers because, whoa, they're just striking, right? Y'all, it seems like only yesterday I was holding these birds in the palm of my hand. Turkeys grow out fast, and here they are. Crystal starts out every session with a toast, and then we got to work. This woman is genius. Carrying a turkey with a wingspan of several feet in both directions can be intense. So she pulls a cutoff sweatpant over the body, then carries the bird to the comb. This keeps the bird calmer and easier to walk with. She calls it the turkey turtleneck. The setup is similar to that of chickens, just with a bigger kill cone for the body. After the bird is dispatched, Crystal adds wax pellets to the hot water scalder. Then we dip the bird's body inside the pot a few times, making sure it gets fully coated in the wax, and then transfer the body to the table for the wax to dry. You know the bird is pretty much ready by touch and sound. Is this <laughs> Crystal takes pride in butchering her birds and using quality cuts. And look, I'm getting really good at not nicking the bones. I'll be a professional butcher by next season for sure. Look y'all, she pulled out the lungs in one piece, which isn't something that happens often. I got a chance to practice ditch batching a few of the turkeys myself, and I am just so appreciative for the guidance I'm getting before I have my homestead. We try to use every part of the bird, which is why you see me taking a few feathers that I plan to use in upcoming projects. I even saved the turkey beard, and I knew my husband would have no idea what this part of the turkey looked like. It was comical what he thought it was. An eyelash? An eyelash? Yeah. From a turkey? Sure. <laughs> Another guess! It's the turkey beard! Huh. Yeah! <laughs> I know! He was like, oh my gosh, I'm holding what? <laughs> In last month's pantry chat, it came as a surprise, well, for some of you it didn't, that I am learning how to hunt. Yep, that's right. I got accepted into my state's deer apprentice program, and my first deer hunt was a couple of weeks ago. Oh, no, 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 the week before last, December 2nd. So I have a mentor, and it's a cohort of us uh, mentees. Maybe there's like 16 of us that are 16 to 20 of us in the group. Um, but I have an apprentice license, but it expires after this season. But I am actually taking, so I did like, um, an online course that you had to do initially, but then there's an in-person class, an assessment, and then actual like shooting practice. And that will give me the actual full hunting license. And <laughs> I signed up to take that class in February. And yeah, the studying has been intense. So yeah, in addition to my online course, there's also this Maryland Guide to Hunting and Trapping. This is just this year's edition. And like, y'all, I really gotta know this stuff. So this is things like um, deer and turkey tagging and checking, migratory birds, uh, deer hunting, what I need for my hunting license. Um, it's just like, there's migratory birds while turkey hunting. Uh, yeah, I have gotta know like when firearm season ends, which actually, this was our last week for firearm season. So really not only do I need, and I will be getting uh, my shotgun, but, but, but there's no rush for me to get one. One, cause like the cost is no joke, even for, you know, a shotgun, which is the most practical kind of way to go. Um, but then I'm also thinking about crossbow, which will give me like just more of a season to like hunt. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna go to a couple of gun shows. And then my dad reminded me that since my husband's also um, a military or Navy, that I can go on base and I won't have to pay taxes. So I'll, I'll figure out my situation here soon enough. But I mean, y'all know me, I'm not gonna rush into making, you know, a purchase like that. If there's anyone that loves outdoor world as much as I do, it's my dad. And remember, I don't go to the mall for like, anything and so i've only actually been to outdoor world a handful of times but the first time i went it was a love at first sight and now i've been there twice in 30 days that's a record so when my dad came up i wrangled him to go to the store with me so we could get a few last minute supplies all right dad doesn't it seem like just the other day i was calling you to let you know that i was going on a hunt now we're shopping for my hunting gun oh. <laughs> it's like hey the beast she's gonna go out and hunt and the beast that I have created. Oh my God! Lord have mercy on Bambi. <laughs> oh. This is my okay. favorite store too. You got an all-terrain vehicle there. You got a boat there. 
What more can you want? What more can you what want? More can you want? <laughs> Life is good. Life is good. Thank you, Dad. We bought a few of the supplies I needed, gloves and sun spray, and headed home. Socks. Here. Hat. It is. It's like, hey, too much, too little. It's baking soda. How expensive is it? Exactly. I would love to learn all the traditional skills, but with a full-time job, I've got to be realistic because all I'm working with is the evenings and the weekends. I would love to learn how to sew well, and I do have a sewing machine. I just... Between like, you know, watching something online, I, I don't do it and maybe, maybe space because I would need to really get set up because I don't like putting all my sewing machine stuff out and then, you know, packing it away. But um, I would really love to be able to say, hey, like I know how to sew. But I know that it's gonna be a challenge because I don't do it often enough to level up. So I kind of resigned to the fact that instead of trying to do, you know, one big project, that I could scale that down and say, hey Cass, focus on just becoming really good at alterations because y'all know, essentially all of my clothes are from the thrift store, but there have been a couple of items in the past that I'm like, oh, I would really like that, but perhaps it's a little bit too long or too big, but that wouldn't be a problem if I knew how to do basic alterations like repair a zipper. And repairing the zipper on a pair of corduroy pants that I found is exactly what I plan to do. So I get home and I sit at the dining room table with all of my supplies and I'm getting ready to, you know, take out, rip out the zipper. And my dad who's sitting on the couch comes over and says, hey, I think there's another method you should try. I'm sitting here with my thrift store pants and I, have my stuff here. I'm getting ready to replace my zipper. But then this one is saying that he might have a better way. All right, Dad, what are you talking about? <laughs> oh, let's see here. Okay, yeah. So if you don't want to go and take the whole zipper out, yeah. what you basically do is come down here. Okay. And right where the zipper would zip up right there, like see right there at the top of the zipper there? Yeah, yeah. You would cut this here. Okay. This way here. You would then take this and slip it onto there and zip it up. And then after you zip it up, yeah. just like a regular zip, it'll be zipped up at that time. Right. And then you come down here where you slid it at and right above there, you sew this side over to this side so that then when you do unzip it it's only going to unzip down to where you tied it together okay and looks like these here probably jump the track up here at the top mm -hmm. so what you want to do up here is come right down below this stop here yep and just make three or four loops mm-hmm and stuff, thick loops and stuff right there. Okay. So that when you zip up your pants and stuff, yeah, they're fair. they're going to again, it won't zip up all the way. It will zip up to just underneath. About right like there. Okay. Yeah. It zip up to about to that to that point there. And track. All right. It is zipping. And then so I zip this all the way up. And there you go. Dad, you're right. Oh my gosh. Okay. And you want to sew this together so right. that so these, on the track. these teeth down here don't come out. So you got to do it tight. Now, the difference between <laughs> becoming a farm girl oh gosh, what? and being this old is... country boy from Louisiana <laughs> this is, true. is that... You know about this stuff. You know about this stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> As I sewed the pants, Dad followed his normal routine, watching Jeopardy. The stone statues on this island? East Great. Island. Now, let's talk shipping. Grace. What is Easter Island? Yes. Landmarks 1000. Nice, Dad. Excessive arrogance or pride. Six letters. Hubris. Correct. What is hubris? Correct. Uh, let's do um, Aerosmith for 600. This Aerosmith power ballad says... Sing with me, sing for the year, sing for the laughter, sing for the tear. Hear it. What is Dream On? That is in Dream On. Dream On! Dream On! What do you know about Aerosmith? What? What? Dad! Z Top and Led Zeppelin. Seriously, Dad? Queens! Dad! Any final words? <laughs> I know you're just waking up.
<laughs> no, I'm just like, oh, my daughter now is the huntress. <laughs> yeah. Um, have fun. You're going to have fun. Yeah. Stay warm and I guess by the end of the year and stuff, I guess I'll look and see what I need to do to get my permit or whatever. The apprentice license and stuff. Hunt up here yeah. and stuff. Okay. And call it a day. I should be able to easily get one. Being retired military, I should be able to get it done pretty easy. Oh, for sure. And we'll go hunting. Wish me luck, booba. All right, y'all, so it is 4.30 and a caravan of us are meeting here at 4.45. I'm here a little early just because I wanted to give myself um, some time to get here. Um, it was really kind of foggy and misty this morning. And although I'm used to, I can get up early. I, I haven't been in a position. Oh, hey. All right, I think it's just me. <laughs> and at the very least, I need a coffee but Oh, you guys, you guys. All right, so we're off. <laughs> likely want to know did I catch anything and if you mean a doe or buck nope not this time instead I caught something else this was my first experience watching the woods wake up being silent in my mind and body from sun up to sundown while having my sense of sight hearing and feel of the wind so attuned to my surroundings it was the best feeling of detachment from the busyness of modern life I had nowhere to be but in my blind, and being with my mentor as we intermittently would carry a whispered conversation about a question I had or something she wanted me to notice. I studied animal tracks, saw antler rubbing for the first time, and during the lunch break at the lodge, shared camaraderie with other apprentice hunters that were just as excited and in awe to be on their first hunt as much as I was. Given that, I had a very successful hunt. Hunting is a lifestyle, so there's no rush. I'm committed for the long haul. Question for you. Can a lady spend over 12 hours hunting one day and then go out to high tea with her daddy the next? Sure she can. This one does. I snagged tickets for a holiday tea at Tudor Place, which was the grand residence of six generations of descendants of Martha Washington. Yes, George Washington's wife. Located in Washington, D.C., the first part of our trip started with a formal tea at the Dower House, the manor home adjacent to the Tudor grounds. Dad enjoyed his tea and fig and brie cheese sandwich, and we were later joined by two other pairs that were also having tea with their parents. They were lovely folks to get to know. After the tea, we were escorted to the Tudor Place grounds for a 45 minute tour of the property. I'm only highlighting a few of the rooms, but being there felt like crossing the threshold of time itself. Tudor Place is a federal style mansion that was originally the home of Thomas Peter and his wife, Martha Park Custis Peter, a granddaughter of Martha Washington. Look at this kitchen, more specifically this cast iron wall, which I need in mine. You heard my dad say earlier he was a country boy, so when he saw this water pump, it really brought back memories of summers on his grandmother's farm. I mean, look at that genuine smile.
I find history to be so much more nuanced, tangible, and rooted when experienced through primary sources like archives, buildings, and preserved emblems of the past, rather than the truncated, watered-down version found in school textbooks. I appreciate how societal, cultural, culinary, economic, invention, and golly, nearly everything collides and can be explored when you tour a home like this. Consider touring the historical landmarks in your state to preserve their place in history for future generations to enjoy. We were on the opposite side. So this is the kitchen. Yep, right here. Yeah. Exterior steps and you come out. Yeah, very practical. Yeah, right there. Very right practical. Here. Yeah. Whatever you need and stuff, it's right here. Yeah. Yeah. And your car and stuff garage and when you're ready to go somewhere it's right there uh-huh um any garden and other stuff you got right you know you want to come outside and you got a nice little thing over here yeah I'm going to pause here because at the end of our tour, we stopped by the gift shop, and while you know I'm not a rash shopper, I do enjoy getting an ornament if the gift shop has one. Now that I've shown you my tree, I think you know why. I had an enjoyable day with my dad. We call trips like these adventures. And now I get to recall this memory on an annual basis alongside the other ornaments of reminders that serve to remind me how thankful to be during the holiday season. It allows me to think about what I've already been blessed enough to have received. And that in and of itself is a gift. All right, dad, so at first you said, man, you got me coming out here for tea and crumpets, but yeah. now what do you think? No, it was good. It was a very, very good experience. Uh, met some good people. We did, yeah. Um, the tour was very enjoyable. And then the bonus going over here to this garden, which you definitely got to come back to we during don't. the spring. I mean, it yeah. is one of the most beautiful places. If it's that lovely in winter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's just, um, you can't imagine how beautiful it's got to be in spring and stuff. So. Right. Looking forward to doing this thing right. Sounds good. On a separate outing, I purchased a fun little pamphlet about notable facts the year my parents were born. You're the same age as Madonna, Michael Jackson, and Alan Jackson? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, what are you saying? No, I mean like Holly weird. It, you just, I didn't realize. I don't, I don't know. Okay, but also, Sharon Stone. Okay, yes. Wow, look at this ad with Elizabeth Taylor. Dad, I, I was about to get on you by saying in 1958, the United States launches its first satellite. <laughs> but then I thought, my, my kids would be like, you were born before the internet? <laughs> Elvis Presley is inducted into the Army. American Express debuts. Um, Debuts, as does the Visa Forerunner Bank of Maricard. Pizza Hut opens in Wichita, Kansas. The first IHOP opens. Okay. Oh, I'm just old. And no, it's just context of like what your, it's a good frame of like what was happening. Now the best sweet potato pie is the one my mama makes. And my grandmother let her northern daughter-in-law in on the trade secrets. Now this year we didn't spend Thanksgiving with my folks, but you better believe I still got my hands on my mama's pies. We are a family that travels with food. So either I'm grabbing jars out of my home camp pantry when they drive up to send back with them, or when mom and dad fly up and make that two hour trip, mom's pulling something out of the freezer, that's for me. When dad came up, the first thing he did was unpack his luggage and hand over the pies. My mom has been so faithful making sure I get her pies every year. Now that I'm married, she makes a pie for me and a pie for Trey because this is one treat we can't share. It's not that I couldn't make these pies, it's that my mom still makes a pie that is one of my favorite tastes from childhood. Mom, I know you're watching this video. Thank you very much. You really spoil me with these pies. Now for some of you, this won't be new news, but this video marks my 12th pantry chat. I started my first one in January of last year. And even if I'm a bit late, I have always posted a monthly pantry chat. And even though these are not my most popular videos, they are my favorite to make. And I'll tell you why. Losing my Nana a little over two years ago, who was also my last living grandparent, really rocked my world. She lived about two hours away, so I would see her frequently. And during my trips to her house, we would always pour over the grocery sales ads. We would talk about what we had stocked up on and how we're planning to, you know, just stretch our food budget. And heck, sometimes we would even run out to the store and get a couple things. And I had a Nana that would pack you down, not only with food, because I always had a cooler, 
But there were also things where, like, I still have them around my house, dishes that she would give me or clothes that she no longer wore, but were still in excellent um, condition. And we just, I mean, we just, we talked about it all. We'd always have a good meal at the table. And then I tell her how work was going and we catch up on things with how the family was doing. And then sometimes we would video call my folks that live in a different state. And, um, you know, I just, I really, and then we would talk about like, maybe like two or three like deep dive topics. Usually maybe it was something that was on my mind or a book that she had read or like news events, what, whatever it was, we would, we would sit and chat. And I just, um, I just missed that rhythm of my life. And so these pantry chats have been a way for me to express what I very much have missed about the trips to my Nana's house. I would share with her my thrift store finds and places that I've been. And I know that these chats can kind of feel like I am throwing in the kitchen sink <laughs> and just talking about it all. But um, I like to think that Nana would be proud. And so actually she would be the one across you know, decades that would be like, you know, you need to stock up on this or you better go out and get this now. Um, none of it was ever, you know, written down as a part of a grocery guide, but it um, it was just a, a cadence. And so what I can say um, of videos is that you can kind of see, well, you can see, um, it's called the retention, right? Uh, in terms of uh, who watches your videos from start to finish, which is hard to do. But my pantry chat videos, a good number of you actually will watch them all the way to the end. And um, I just appreciate that because I feel like if you, whoa, <laughs> that um, in every video, I'm genuine. But if you enjoy these pantry chats, um, it's such a, a well-rounded I'm really showing you the highs of my everyday you know, life, what I appreciate. And so I really consider the people that watch the pantry chats like, like my core friends. Anyways, I don't know if I should continue these chats because if, if I do, they will largely be a, a, a repeat of what I've already shown because you know that's the point when you have a preservation kitchen, right? You don't have to chase after coupons. There's this rhythm that I can just, that I have naturally fallen into. It's not like you need memberships at store so-and-so to eat well and affordably. And a lot of it is the same. And I really take comfort in that. So if you can let me know either, hey, Cassandra, I'm good, move on to something else. And I'll be sure just to organize it with um, I don't know. I'm not too good at like the back end organization, but I can put it in a playlist. That's where I was looking for. Um, or if you're like, hey, actually go ahead and continue your pantry chats. Now I do have other seasonal recipes that I often end up cutting out or just not filming because these videos are like 30 minutes and they have turned into mini movies, but um, I don't know. That's just the way the cookie has crumbled. So the month before last, when I was at the Homesteaders of America conference, I was having a conversation with someone and what I'm sharing with you came up and I said, oh, you know, like, I'm not sure if I'm going to, you know, continue the pantry chats. And she had said to me, she said, hey, Cassandra, I know that you can always go back and rewatch people's videos, but that is not something that I like do in actuality. And she said, even if it is, you know, some of the same thing um, that she wouldn't mind because she would prefer to have that kind of monthly real time reminder. And so, I mean, that had me thinking like, OK, like, that kind of makes sense. I mean, I do the same thing, too. Right. I have a couple of videos that are you know, saved here and there, but um, that list would be so long now. So generally, um, yeah. And even I couldn't always tell you, I'm trying to think because my videos are kind of like, you know, crammed in everything in the kitchen sink. Like I don't, it's hard for me to even think like, oh, in this month's pantry chat, we talked about X, Y, and Z. So I don't know. But I had to say thank you for tuning into a series that does feel pretty random. But more importantly, I have shared the most important people in my life. And you all have been so kind, my mom and my dad and my small circle of friends. And that, that really means a lot. For more pantry tips and preservation inspiration, click on the video on your screen. I'll see you in my kitchen or garden soon. Take care, friends.